The Houston Outlaws are entering this season with perhaps their most interesting lineup since 2018. After putting together a somewhat successful year that nearly saw them make the playoffs, Houston tried to make their roster go to the next level through multiple changes. Do they have what it takes to level up? Let's talk about it. If you're new to this series, we go over teams in three sections. First is what they did during the offseason. Second is a general consensus on their roster strengths and weaknesses. And third are some general projections on where I believe said team can finish in the overall standings. Sound good? Alright, cool. To begin with, we have a very interesting Houston offseason. Despite having their best record in a season ever, the Outlaws decided to let quite a few of their players go from 2021. In a statement that shows they believe in Piggy as their guy, both Jangu and Dreamer were not renewed. Neither player was blowing you away necessarily, but I'd like to think that both were decent options. Jangu had explosiveness, and Dreamer had the flexibility, but I guess neither one of them were all that valuable according to the Outlaws. I think that John Goose's departure in particular led to a lot of community backlash, since a lot of fans believed that he absolutely deserved another chance. I'm of the belief, personally, that a lot of people were overrating him, but I do agree that it was a little surprising to see him go. I can understand feeling like him and Dream are replaceable, but it still does feel a little weird. Their main tanks definitely showed potential. But oh well, life goes on, I suppose. At support? Houston felt the need to purge everybody. I totally understand this from, like, a main support perspective, let's say. Juby had a nice Lucio and everything, but his flexibility was lacking. And with Jake, he decided to commit full-time to coaching duties this year, and he wasn't that amazing anyway, so I see no problem here. What's weird to me, though, is their refusal to bring back Crimzo. The man had a strong sophomore year, and was undoubtedly a high-level flex support who showed excellent performances. His dominance on BAP... Anna and Zen are worthy of praise. It's worth mentioning that Crimzo wanted to come back, so obviously this is more of an Outlaws thing. Crimzo may not have been S-tier, but was extremely reliable. Hopefully this isn't something that comes back to bite them. Moving on to DPS, the Outlaws said goodbye to KSF, who retired, and was mostly on the bench anyway, as well as Happy. The latter departure is obviously more significant, seeing as Happy was basically a full-time starter. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. Happy has ridiculous upside, but that inconsistency is a major turnoff. It's something he's never fixed after three years. It's clear what you're getting with Happy. He's a crazy talented sniper and everything, but he might not be championship material. I don't really mind the Outlaws moving on from him. Why stick with a clear-cut ceiling when you can take a risk on a brand new prospect? Aside from that, the Outlaws also saw a coaching change as Harsha decided to retire. His time as a coaching leader was filled with ups and downs. Season 3 was a complete disaster under his leadership, and it kind of feels like the Season 4 success more so came from Junk Buck. Harsha's retirement doesn't affect the Outlaws all that much in the long run, so this is okay. Overall, a few Houston departures could catch you off guard. For me, it's gotta be their decision at Flexiport, because that really did seem like a place where they finally established some consistency. It's also a little weird, again, to see that they just completely wanted to start over at Tank aside from Piggy, but I can kind of understand it. The leadership of this team took a turn, and obviously they came up short of their goals, so even if Main Tank and Flexiport were a lot better than they once were, it still wasn't enough. The Outlaws are looking to go above and beyond this year. Now is not the time to settle. They want to kick off Overwatch 2 on the right foot. After all, some of the moves they made this offseason were fantastic. The big elephant in the room obviously comes from the trade they made with the Atlanta Reign to acquire Pelican. In one of the biggest trades in recent memory, if not of all time, Houston managed to add one of the best damage dealers in the game to their ranks. And it really does not matter if there's any sort of overlap between him and Dante. Pelican is the type of player to instantly make your team better. He's an MVP caliber player. Houston have never had that type of guy for their entire existence. So as far as I'm concerned, Houston just paved the way for a much brighter future. Pelican is so ridiculously flexible. He can play pretty much anything you ask him to, and he's going to play it at the highest level possible. He instantly gives you more reliability than that of Happy as well. 
As far as I'm concerned, Houston took nothing but Ws by getting Pelican. And just to make their DPS line even spicier, they decided to take a chance on Merit as their new hitscan. This 19-year-old rookie established quite a reputation on Runway and recently for O2 Blast. He's got a rich history in the Korean contender scene as he tended to hold his own against most of the competition. The key takeaway is that he's consistent, maybe not superstar material, but good enough to get the job done. Consistency at the hitscan position is something Houston have pretty much never known. The only thing is, I'm not entirely sure if he can dominate in the same manner as like Happy or even Lynxer. There might be some sort of trade-off here. At bare minimum though, Houston is getting an interesting prospect. Merritt has shown strengths on characters such as Widowmaker, Ash, Cassidy, and Sombra, all while showing steady improvement throughout the years. This is the kind of guy who deserves a shot. Some people were honestly surprised that he wasn't in the league last year, which is a fair thing to complain about. But at the same time, maybe an extra year did him some good in the long run. Maybe he truly is league ready now. He's had time to mature and hone his skills. Something else to note is that his role on this team should be pretty manageable. Houston need him to perform, obviously, but it's not going to be all on him. Pelican and Dante are the main playmakers, so he'll likely be more of a secondary player, and that's something he's kind of already used to. The man played with proper for crying out loud. He might feel right at home. And if he's playing pressure-free Overwatch, his rookie transition is going to go very smoothly. I love this approach by the Houston Outlaws. Merritt is a solid choice. He's got the skill set you're looking for with the chance to grow into something really special. From there, the train of good pickups just keeps on rolling. To complete the Houston roster heading into day one, they signed both Iris and Lastro to give them some ridiculous playmaking at the support position. Iris, I mean, he had a fantastic year for Atlanta. It's up for debate if he's as flexible as Crimson, let's say, but the upside is just as good, if not better. And if worse comes to worse, Lastro can play flex support for the moments where Iris can't get the job done. I think that these two could make for a good flex support combination. They're both well-proven players who are capable of being stars. And don't even get me started on what could happen if a double flex support meta comes around. That's when they'll truly be a deadly combo that you don't want to face. Crimson may be gone, but they might be even better off without him when it's all said and done. Emphasis on the word might, by the way. As cool as Lastro and Iris are, Houston are in quite the weird situation. They have no main support heading into day one. Lastro and or Iris will be forced to play an unnatural position for the non-double flex support metas. Is that really something we can trust them to handle? That's going to be a huge question that dictates how far Houston can go. We'll talk more on this matter later. For now, we got to talk about how Houston addressed their coaching situation. As mentioned earlier, Junkbuck is now the sole leader at head coach, and Jake is transitioning to a full-time assistant role, and I for one believe that both of these decisions will only benefit Houston. This is truly Junkbuck's team now. He can implement his winning ways fully while forming a team in his vision. Junk is a great coach, and I'm expecting great things from him. On the side of Jake, just having him focus on one thing should be something that helps both him and the team out. Last year, his attention was split, both playing main support and coaching at the same time. Giving him just one role to focus on should make him have higher odds of making good contributions. Jake can be a solid coach due to his knowledge, leadership, and understanding nature. But Jake won't be the only assistant. To sweeten the deal further, Houston also picked up Ho Chi Lee from Toronto as a second assistant to give them a three-man staff. The Defiant weren't anything out of the ordinary last year, so it's telling to me that Junkbuck had an interest in hiring this guy. If Junkbuck doesn't mind working with him, then maybe we should give some trust. A scheme change could be all that this guy needs to thrive and make some better contributions. The combined efforts of him, Junk, and Jake could lead to some great results. This is definitely a place where I feel pretty confident in Houston. Good work. That just about sums up the Houston offseason, though. I'd say that it had some ups and downs. They gained some valuable assets, but it does come with some burning questions that leave you confused. Let me sum up my thoughts on their current roster. For starters, they're rocking with a six-man team, which means that they're giving themselves little room for error. And given that Houston actually have some expectations now, this could cause even more pressure to perform. Think about how weird some of their positions feel, you know? Support is obviously like the big one that we already mentioned. I think Lastro and Iris are both amazing, but the fact that one of them has to play main support just feels so concerning. I recall Lastro playing some break back in 2020, but that's just about the only time he's ever played this position at the Overwatch League level. And just to make matters worse, that one hour of break is the only experience between him and Iris combined. 
This isn't like Season 1 from back in the day, where you'd see flex supports commonly play things like Mercy and Lucio. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen here in the modern day. Who's gonna play what? Is there gonna be some sort of rotation based on the meta? I have zero clue if this is gonna work, nor if they'll be any good. Someone is playing an unnatural position no matter what. You could have one of them commit to main support full time, I suppose, but that too could end up being a risk. If there's any good news that comes with it though, both Lastro and Iris are very trustworthy, so there is a world where they figure something out. They're smart guys who make the big plays when they matter. Additionally, you know you're going to be set at flex support no matter what, so it could be worse. They're both solid options, and like I said before, if double flex support's a thing, they're gonna be deadly. I'm just worried though, you know, and I think it's kind of natural to feel that way. I pray to the lord that they figure it out, because otherwise, this is going to be the same situation as last year, where they have some sort of weakness at main support. Now, if this was the only position facing burning questions, it wouldn't be so bad, but the fact of the matter is, they're facing a similar situation at tank. In general, Piggy's excellent. He more than proved himself throughout 2021. I mean, his impact could be felt no matter what he was playing. But Overwatch 2 is a brand new ball game. A solo tank format where he has to do everything by himself is a daunting task. This is a huge test for Piggy. This is where we find out just how good he truly is. If the meta calls for off-tank heroes, he's gonna do fine. But what happens if something else becomes the meta, you know? There's five other tank characters in the game that we have never seen him play before if you count Doomfist. Piggy might be a great player, but Houston is putting a mountain of pressure on him to do everything by himself. Would I be surprised if he happens to be good on a couple of the typical main tank heroes? No, it's surely a possibility, but to say he's guaranteed to be great no matter what would be foolish. A solo tank system takes away practice time from some of the other stuff that Piggy is best at as well. There could be some sort of trade-off. In a world where his main tank heroes aren't that bad, we could see his off-tank play take a bit of a hit. I fear that Houston could be facing a disadvantage compared to some of the other rosters who have two tanks to shoulder the burden. Given that Houston finalized their roster after they got access to Overwatch 2, I'm assuming the situation could be better than I'm making it out to be, but it's still something to consider regardless. In my opinion, the only place to have close to 100% confidence in is DPS. Not only is it the only place with a rotation, but it also offers the most versatility by far. I don't find myself asking a lot of questions about them. Obviously, we've got to see if Merit pans out, but he's a rookie, so that's only natural. And I'd say his experience puts him in a better place than a lot of his fellow rookies. Just the fact that he's got a good track record makes you feel pretty good. The only issue at this point is if he's elite or not. How does he do in those marquee matchups against, like, Kai or Ans, let's say? There's no telling if he holds his own. But at that point, I'm kind of nitpicking because, again, he's more of a secondary playmaker. What else is there to really criticize, though? Maybe Pelican takes a good bit of Dante's playtime or vice versa, but that's a minor thing. You know you've got a reliable carry no matter what, so who cares? Not to mention that people act like there's a 0% chance they're in the lineup at the same time. It's more than possible. These two could work wonderfully in any sort of heavy dive meta. You no longer have to worry about Dante being unable to play both Tracer and Sombra at the same time because somebody like Pelican is there to back him up. And think about the possibilities with Echo Comps, among a couple of other things. These two will definitely play together, and when they do, they're gonna be hard to stop. They have the synergy as well as the godlike playmaking. Houston's DPS line is one of the scariest in the West. They should, in theory, have what it takes to keep up with just about anybody in the league, especially if Merit proves to be reliable. Liable. DPS is once again the strong point of the Houston roster, and they're arguably better than ever. No matter what ends up happening, you can expect them to carry on a regular basis. DPS is the least of this team's concerns. Support and tank are the big what-ifs here. They just need to prove that flexibility isn't a problem. That's like the one thing standing between them and potential greatness. It's not like they're one of those teams who lack star players. They might only have six players currently, but they're pretty stacked. They've already won half the battle in a sense. Everybody's capable of holding their own based on the history and everything, but I can't shake the weirdness of seeing Piggy, Iris, and Lastro all off-rolling potentially. Plenty of teams in the league do face a similar issue, it's just that Houston are dealing with it on multiple positions, which arguably puts them at a bigger disadvantage. Most of your players have to play out of their comfort zones. Management and coaching are going to come out and say everything's fine, but how will things go during the official games? As an outsider looking in, 
the outlaws are rolling the dice. They're praying to the gods that the meta lines up in their favor. I don't like that. Lastro, Iris, and Piggy are all amazing, and they seem capable of making the appropriate adjustments they need to, but I've thought the same for other players in the past making similar transitions, and it usually has not worked out for them. It really sucks too, because this is like the one thing that keeps me from completely loving this team. They look and feel so awesome, but deep down I have my doubts. A talented team with so many question marks deserves a wide range of possibilities with how their season goes. I project the Houston Outlaws to finish anywhere from 11th through 5th in the overall standings, and 7th through 3rd in North America. This team could be vastly overrated. If the flexibility proves to be a problem, among a few other things, they could even fall out of the top 10. But at the same time, their sheer talent could see them output an even better season than last year. If Piggy and the supports do fine and Merit transitions well, they'll be a force you don't want to mess with. To say they're guaranteed to be insane would be a mistake though. There's too many factors that need to go their way. Houston's not meta-proof, and no matter how talented they are, fielding six men with zero backups at two places could put you at a disadvantage. I'd like nothing more than to say that this year is a guaranteed hit for the Outlaws, but there's no way I could possibly do that without actually watching them first. They've got their leaders, and they have their clear-cut strengths. That puts them in a pretty decent spot, but how much further can they push it? And until we reach that fateful day where they play the Dallas Fuel, that is where we leave things. The Outlaws are an interesting team to keep an eye on, but are they going to deliver? Or is there reason to be concerned? Let me know down in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this video and you want more just like it, consider hitting the like and subscribe button if you're new. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.